Welcome back everyone to week 11 of the Blue Planet and our third lecture on the oceans. In today's lecture we'll be exploring currents and circulation in the deep ocean, in particular looking at the role of density in driving deep ocean currents. So learning objectives for today are set out here and I'll leave you to go through those. If we look at this temperature distribution plot for the surface ocean, which we've seen in previous lectures, you'll notice the high temperatures here in the Western Pacific, slightly cooler temperatures along the Eastern Ocean boundaries and much colder temperatures at high latitudes. And you'll recall the mid-latitude ocean gyres were largely responsible for this distribution of temperature here with the gradients across the ocean basins. Now what happens as we go down into the ocean? So this next section here plots the distribution of temperatures at 1000 metres depth in the ocean. And you can see here the temperature drops off remarkably. Throughout much of the ocean, you'll be able to see that the temperatures at least in the Pacific and the Atlantic and indeed much of the Indian oceans are between about four and six degrees Celsius. They're significantly colder right around the margins of Antarctica and also as you move into very high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. There are a couple of places in the ocean where the temperatures are significantly warmer, here near the Mediterranean Sea and over here near the Arabian Sea. And these represent outflow of water at this depth into the main ocean basins. A characteristic of temperature profiles in the ocean is in the tropical equatorial regions, we have very strong thermoclines. So a thermocline is the temperature change with depth. So we have very warm surface temperatures and very strong gradients in temperature going down to around about 1000 meters. And those thermoclines decrease in strength as we get closer to the poles where at very high latitude in the polar oceans we effectively have no thermocline at all and the temperature of the ocean is pretty much the same from top to bottom. Now here's another temperature section through the ocean at three kilometres depth now and this one's quite interesting because it shows very distinct temperatures in the Pacific an Indian Ocean, very uniform temperatures at around about one and a half to two degrees, as compared to over here in the Atlantic Ocean, where again we have uniform temperatures, but they're between two and a half and three degrees. So a small but very significant difference. And again, you can see these very cold temperatures here, right in the vicinity of Antarctica at these depths. So to look at that in a slightly different way, we now have a section through the Pacific Ocean. It's a little small here, but you might be able to make out Australia. And this section goes from around about 65 south up against the margin of Antarctica, all the way up to Alaska. And what you'll notice is the temperature, apart from when we're at very high latitude, in either the southern or northern hemisphere, the temperature decreases more or less progressively as we go down through the ocean. This is the same plot but showing salinity. And in this case, there isn't a progressive change in salinity from top to bottom of the ocean. We actually see these two relatively low salinity tongues of seawater intruding between two higher salinity water masses. So just to recap there, we have the thermocline in the upper part of the ocean. So this is showing depths from the very surface right down to the deepest part of the ocean from zero to four kilometres. This example shows a very strong thermocline. We can also see that we often get a, a halocline, which is the salinity change from the surface as we go down. If we took a profile of salinity here, it wouldn't look as simple as this. It would actually have high salinity with a bend back and then going down. And then there's the picnocline. Now, the picnocline means density. And in all cases, density will always increase with depth. And we'll have a little closer look at that in a second. So seawater density. 
Density is defined as the mass per unit volume, so either grams per cubic centimetre or kilograms per litre. Water expands when it's heated and it contracts when salt is added. Density increases with temperature and increases with salinity. Now we can approximate that with a simple function of this nature, which relates measured density to a reference density and it decreases as a function of temperature. So this is why this is a minus here and it increases as a function of salinity. And here's a plot showing the change in seawater density in grams per cubic centimetre or kilograms per litre, same thing. And we can see that going from over a typical range of salinities between 33 and a half and 36 and a half PSU, or from temperatures around minus two up to 20 degrees, we only have a very small change in density from 1.024 through to 1.029 grams per cubic centimetre, or only 0 0.005 grams difference across that whole temperature and salinity range. Just a little note here, these values of alpha and beta here are the thermal expansion coefficient of seawater, i.e. how much it expands per degree C increase, and the salinity contraction coefficient. So that's how much the seawater contracts as its salinity increases. And these values here, the zero values are reference values at particular temperature relative to a reference temperature of 25 degrees and 35 salinity units. So let's think now a little bit about buoyancy. So a volume of water that differs in its density from its surrounding water will experience a buoyancy force that is proportional to the density difference between that volume of water and the surrounding water. And that force is proportional to the volume times the density difference multiplied by the gravitational acceleration constant. Now, volume times the density difference is equivalent to mass. So this is simply force equals mass times acceleration. Fb equals mass times the gravitational acceleration. And as a result of this buoyancy force due to density differences between water masses, we have these density differences drive vertical motion of water within the ocean with denser water sinking and less dense water rising through the ocean. So moving on and thinking back to sea surface density. So, so far we've simply looked at temperature and salinity variations in the ocean. If we now convert those salinity and temperature variations to density variations for the surface ocean and plot those up, we see very high densities around Antarctica and at very high latitude in the North Atlantic, in the Arctic Ocean here. And you can also see there are some very high densities here in the Mediterranean Sea and also up here in the Arabian Gulf and the Red Sea. If we're forming dense water in these parts of the ocean, then those will be the dense waters that then sink into and fill up the deep ocean, hence explaining why the deep ocean is full of colder water. So now we've moved to the Atlantic Ocean, so going from the up adjacent to Antarctica all the way to Iceland. Uh, we have a cross-section of the potential temperature through the Atlantic Ocean from south to north and we can see very distinct water masses with very distinct temperatures in different parts of the ocean basin. And we can see the cold Antarctic margin sourced water descending in and filling up the southern part of the North Atlantic and then we have the cold Northern source water from north of Iceland. This is showing the sea floor. This is the topography and this is Iceland here. The North Atlantic deep water is sourced further to the north and it's flowing in and filling up the North Atlantic from north to south. And this cartoon shows the flow of those water masses into the basin and how they fill it up. So you note that the, here we have the 
wind-driven divergence of water around Antarctica due to the strong westerlies, which push water towards the equator from this zone. And that water that gets pushed north ends up flowing to the north, but because it is of greater density than the surface waters flowing to the south, then because it's denser, it sinks below those, but it's also slightly warmer and fresher now than the upwelling water, so it's less dense than the North Atlantic deep water. The other thing you'll notice of this plot is that oceanographers describe these water masses in the deep ocean based on where they come from at the surface around the globe. So we have Antarctic bottom water, known as AABW, North Atlantic deep water, NADW, Antarctic intermediate water, or AAIW. We have this Mediterranean water here, which you can just see. We'll take a little extra look at that in a second. And we also have the Central Atlantic surface water here. Another feature we might note before we pass on is that where we have the big mid-latitude gyres, you'll see that we have convergent flow towards the centre of those gyres here and here. And so we have a thickening of these warmer, less dense, more buoyant surface waters at the centre of the gyres. Okay, this is just another plot the same section saying, showing the salinity distribution from south to north in the Atlantic Basin. And you can see how this Antarctic intermediate water has a quite distinct salinity compared to the surrounding water. So it has significantly lower salinity than the water. It's the North Atlantic deep water coming up and also the Central Atlantic surface water that's moving south. So because its density is intermediate between those, it moves in and works its way in along that density horizon further north. Now the other thing you can see on here is this little bullseye, significantly higher salinity water, and that is the water that's flowing out of the Mediterranean Ocean here. Here we have this Mediterranean water again. Over on the right here we have our density diagram, and if we plot up the densities of the particular source regions for all of these different water masses on this diagram. We have Antarctic bottom water here, North Atlantic deep water here, Antarctic intermediate water here, and we have this Atlantic central surface water right out here, so this very warm surface water. And you can see that as we go from bottom of the ocean to the top of the ocean, we come up and the density increases all the way as we go all the way up to the top of the to the surface of the ocean here at, at zero metres. And the density variation is really very, very tiny. It's only one part in a thousand. So a little closer look now at the Mediterranean source water here. And now this section is slightly different and this is a latitudinal section that runs from the east coast of North America across to the Strait of Gibraltar. And this Mediterranean source water shows up very nicely here as this high salinity water that's intruded at greater depth than this other or lower salinity water and lower density water above it. And the reason why it intrudes at this depth, the sill, uh, the height of the sill at the Strait of Gibraltar is only 900 metres at its maximum. So this water flows out of the Mediterranean at about this height here and then sinks into the ocean and finds its neutral buoyancy level in the North Atlantic. And that's sort of shown here where here is our section going from depth up to the surface of the North Atlantic, showing the different water masses. And here's our Mediterranean water coming out of the Mediterranean, and it has an intermediate density between the North Atlantic deep water down here and the Antarctic intermediate water, which works its way all the way up to the northern part of the basin and is sort of sitting in, in a tiny finger of it sitting in here. So just standing back now for a second, we've just been looking, describing the deep ocean flow through the oceans via this thermohaline circulation. But as we've seen, there's also a wind-driven component of this deep ocean circulation. And just to reflect on that a little, if we go back to our example here, 
This flow whereby this water, North Atlantic deep water, is drawn up to the surface is entirely generated by the, the wind-driven divergent flow and upwelling resulting as a function of that, as is this flow north and subsequent density-driven flow of this water mass beneath this one. So it's wrong to think of the flow in the deep ocean as just being due to the thermohaline or density-driven circulation. It's really a combination of, of both the buoyancy and wind forcings and should really be referred to as the meridional overturning circulation of the ocean. This is a slightly more complicated diagram and we won't spend too much time looking at it, but it's uh, quite a useful diagram in dividing up and thinking about how the flows through the ocean at different levels vary around Antarctica and into the different ocean basins. So it's quite a useful way of representing those flows and the circulation as a function of depth through those ocean basins. So before we finish this lecture, we'll just step back again and revisit some of the work we did in last week's tutorial. And that was asking the question, how long does water spend in the deep ocean? So with the example in the tutorial, we use the radiocarbon composition of deep ocean water to determine that the flow time to go all the way from here up in the Arctic Ocean at the start of the deep thermohaline circulation there, density driven flow circulation all the way around the bottom of the Pacific uh, Southern Ocean here and then up into the Pacific took over a thousand years and we worked out that the current speeds were really low, they're only of the order of one millimetre per second or so. So these ages give the ventilation time. So that's the last time that the water that's found here at the bottom of the ocean was last in contact with the atmosphere at the surface. Here's an additional calculation that calculates the resonance time as opposed to the ventilation time. So we know that the volume of the deep ocean is about 1.4 times 10 to the 18 cubic metres. A significant amount of data collected by oceanographers shows that the rate of sinking or formation of deep water in the North Atlantic is about 20 million cubic metres per second, or 20 spurtrups. The rate of formation in the Southern Ocean around Antarctica is only about half that. It's only about 10 spurtrups. On the basis of that, here we have an amount and here we have our total flux of water into the deep ocean. So let's divide our amount by the total flux. And when we do that, we come up with 4.7 times 10 to the 10 seconds or 1500 years. So this is the best estimate we have of the resonance time of water or the average time that water spends in the deep ocean before returning back to the surface, about 1,500 years. And there's just that slight distinction between the ventilation time, which simply measures the time at which the water was last in contact and exchanged dissolved gases and heat with the atmosphere. Right, now, just before we finish, understanding how water flows through the deep ocean is really quite important because when we start looking at the carbon dioxide distribution within the ocean, we start seeing plots like this. So here we have the Atlantic from south to north. We've looked at this section before. You can see the Antarctic bottom water source coming in here and it has um, quite high CO2 concentrations relative to the North Atlantic deep water, which fills up most of this part of the basin. And then we have lower concentrations in the surface water. Now this is the Indian Ocean but let's look closely at the Pacific Ocean so, and you can see in the Pacific Ocean that we have a similar sort of distribution with much higher CO2 concentrations at depth and as we move from south to north in the Pacific Ocean the CO2 concentrations actually go up significantly. So our thermohaline circulation or the deep density flow through the ocean, around here and up into the North Pacific, follows this sort of path down here to around here, then it comes around Antarctica and reappears here somewhere, and then moves up into the North Pacific. And you can see, as we go along this path, 
that the water accumulates about 10 to 15 percent more CO2 as it goes along that path. So that's interesting and we'll be exploring why that is the case in subsequent lectures. One of the other reasons why there's this significant difference between the surface ocean and the deep ocean is that the source of water into the deep ocean is from the very cold polar regions and based on our Coke bottle analogy, we also know that we can dissolve more CO2 in cold water than what we can in warm water. Where we have water in contact with the atmosphere at high latitude, where it's cold, compared to low latitudes around the equator where it's warmer, we will dissolve more CO2 in those cold high latitude waters than what there would be at low latitude surface waters that are warm. So that's also part of the reason why the water in the deeper ocean is higher in CO2, and that's simply because the source region for those cold waters is high latitudes in the polar regions. Right, so final slide here. This is a really interesting diagram that shows the distribution of the uptake of human produced carbon. So this is anthropogenic carbon by the ocean from the atmosphere. And so this is for the surface ocean relative to the atmosphere. And these green areas are regions where the ocean is taking up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. And these are negative numbers here for the purple region. So the purple areas are where the ocean is releasing carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. Just to get you to think about that, you might imagine our mid-latitude ocean gyres going around like this. So they might be partly responsible for some of this pattern. And you can imagine in the North Pacific like this, you can see a similar thing here with the Gulf Stream. So that whole Gulf Stream area up there is a big sink for CO2. So the ocean's taking up CO2 in this uh, very green area here. Thinking back to our distribution of CO2 in the deep ocean, we know that the deep ocean water has higher CO2 concentrations than the shallow surface ocean, particularly where it's warm. So when we upwell water from depth in the ocean and that water brings to the surface very high CO2 concentrations and as that water reaches the surface and then begins to warm up, it can't retain all of that high dissolved CO2 and it releases it to the atmosphere. Contrary to that, where we have surface waters that are cooling down, they absorb more CO2 from the atmosphere. So when you think about our ocean gyre here, we have warm equatorial surface waters moving down like this, cooling down. As they cool down, they can absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. And over here where we have wind driven upwelling along the coast of South America here, we have very big up, upwelling of cool water from deeper in the ocean in this region here. We're bringing that cool water to the surface, warming it up and releasing a significant amount of dissolved CO2 from that water as it migrates across the Pacific and warms up. And that pattern is more or less repeated around the whole ocean in different ways. So there's another big uh, upwelling region over here um, near the Arabian Sea, Red Sea area. So just to make a couple of statements here, the world's oceans will be currently acting as a long-term sink for CO2 emissions from human activities. By absorbing CO2, the ocean is also reducing the amount of warming that anthropogenic emissions into the atmosphere would otherwise cause. The most recent estimates in 2017 indicate the ocean absorbed about 2.6 gigatons, or billion tonnes of carbon released from human activities in that particular year. And this had increased significantly by over a third from the previous estimate for the period 2005 to 2015, where the average uptake was only 1.9 billion tonnes. So currently at the moment, the ocean is actually helping us out and is absorbing more CO2 as we proceed in time, but the question is, will that continue to be the case? A final little note here 
is that often when you see a newspaper reports or other reports, people often refer to CO2 emissions in or amounts in gigatons of CO2 rather than carbon. There's a significant difference between them both because of the atomic mass of carbon versus the molecular weight of carbon dioxide. So 10 gigatons of carbon, which is the current anthropogenic emission rate per year, that actually equals 36.7 gigatons of CO2. Okay, on that note, I'll finish up.